got a question for you. How many of you have run out of gas in your car? Raise your hand. You run out of gas. I ran out of gas once coming down the interstate, well, it's State Highway 59, and I was on the exit ramp, and I eased right into the station and stopped right at the pump. <laughs> Now, if you've never ran out of gas, you probably don't need today's service, right? But now, i got another question for you. How many of you wait until the tank is half empty before you fill up? Gets half empty, you fill up. How many wait until it's a quarter of a tank before you fill it up? How many of you wait until the light comes on to fill it up? How many of you wait until it says you're at zero miles before you decide to fill up? How many of you gone where it says five miles past and you decide it's time to stop? <laughs> my problem is my steering wheel for me to sit uh, in the seat. To, see, I got a problem. I always wear my hat. So I got to have the chair a certain way. And I've got to get the steering wheel just right. And I, I've got to make sure I can see the speedometer. But the trouble is the way my steering wheel is, it blocks the gas gauge. And so sometimes it's kind of lower because mine makes a noise. It lets me know, hey, you got a problem. But sometimes I don't hear the noise. And uh, I, did, I have recently got it where it was 10 miles past empty. You know, they do that so you don't run out of gas. You realize that. And I made it and got gas, so just saying. Um, but I'm going to give you 10 reasons you run out of gas. You say, I thought this was not a, a, a church, not an automobile society. Well, it's about your spiritual gas, your emotional gas, your relational gas. So, so 10 reasons you run out of gas is not starting out with a full tank. Not starting out with a full tank. So you need to start the morning with a full tank. I remember a few weeks ago, I was at a busy schedule. I was with some friends, and uh, somebody told me, Max, fill your tank up before you go home. Okay, yes, I hear you. And so I did. But, you know, a lot of us, uh, we don't start out the day with the full spiritual tank. Now, you can fill up your tank one of two ways. I used to, for years, fill up my spiritual tank. I would pray at night. Before I went to bed, I would pray long and hard before I went to sleep, because in the morning it took a bomb to wake me up, and I was groggy. I'd take my shower, and then I would just make it to work or whatever on time. So for me, at that point in my life, I would pray at night. So I'd fill up my tank before I went to sleep. But now I wake up at six o'clock in the morning, whether I want to or not. I mean, it just I'm awake. Um, I got this alarm thing that goes off. And um, I've had to move it to the other side of the room because sometimes I, I turn it off and I forget I turned it off. Because, but I get out of bed, so I got to turn it off um, so that Marvin doesn't gripe at me for being late. But uh, now I fill up my spiritual tank in the morning and pray, read my Bible before the day. But either way, you fill up your tank before you start out your day. And the trouble with not filling up your tank in the morning is during the day you can wind up being low on gas. And so your emotional energy, your spiritual energy will be declined. And second, we run out of gas because we're too busy to stop and refuel. Have you ever done that? You're too busy to stop and get more? You know, you can relate to that because, you know, during the day, somebody says, well, I'm just so busy I don't have time to pray. Well, you know, you, you're, well, actually, some of us are too busy not to even eat, right? So, but you've got to take that time. Frankly, um, when I'm studying, the worst thing you can do is just study. You need to stop every 45 minutes and take a break, walk down the hall, give Marv a hard time or Andrea or Lynn, and then go back and study. Because if you just keep on studying what happens, it just kind of runs together and you, it's, it's a mess. But so no matter what type of work you do, you need to take 
breaks, and a good thing to do in a break is pray so you can recharge your tank, especially when some people are irritating you uh, where you work. Now, that wouldn't happen to you, but it happens to me sometimes. You know, but of course, it wouldn't happen to you. Um, three, ignoring the owner's manual. See, your owner's manual, by the way, is the Bible, okay? But ignoring the owner's manual and pushing my car farther than it was created to go. Now, I've got a 20-gallon tank. Actually, my, you, know, you might have a 20-gallon tank or a 10-gallon tank. i got a 26-gallon tank. And I think it's really about a 27-gallon tank, but they just say 26. Um, if you go far beyond the limits of your owner's manual, what you're going to run out of gas. Now, you're not Superman or Superwoman because you're riding in something, so you can run out of gas. And so it also has to do with your spiritual vitality. You think, well, I, I'm a Superman. I can take on anything. And then what happens? You get immersed and then they burn out, and then you start biting off everybody's head around you. You ever do that? You, know, you get worn out, then what happens? You get cranky, and then nobody wants to be around you because you're cranky, because you're exhausted and worn out. So don't get exhausted and worn out. Take time to recharge. Rest and relax. And it's called what? The Sabbath. God wants us to put it in the Ten Commandments. He says, take a break. And actually, you come back stronger if you take a break than if you just keep on going. Here's one you may forget. Being unaware of hidden leaks that are draining you. Being unaware of hidden links that are draining you. Most common uh, leaks in our emotional vitality is relationships. Frankly, some relationships we have are, are toxic. You say, yeah, I gotta, but I got to, there's an old friend or whatever, and I got to be, and they're just pulling you down. And also your responsibilities. You can have so many responsibilities that it weighs you down. That's why you need to give away some responsibilities. Some things you just don't need to do. Sometimes you need to make sure you give them to somebody else because they do a better job than you can. But sometimes people just keep on, they'll give it away, then they come and take it back and put it back on them. You wouldn't do that now, Debbie, would you? Yeah, yeah. Mm. See, I know Debbie. She was there smiling. Yeah, you're talking about me. It just happened to be here. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, you know, during this, um, you know, conflict drains our energy. Criticism drains our energy. So does disappointment drain our energy, and fatigue drains our energy. And those leaks come along, and we don't even realize our energy is being leaked out by all these other things that are happening. Five. Being in a hurry. I don't know who that'd be. The guilty party, yeah. Yeah, I'm always, it seems to be in a hurry, but I, I did play golf yesterday. Hadn't played in six months, so I, I finally got out there, and actually I played better than I had been. I would watched uh, Rick Steele, I've been watching his golf videos, and uh, they've been really helpful. He's British, he's got that br British brogue and so forth. Interesting fellow. But I learned how to do that better. And see, sometimes we as Christians, we, we've, we know all the stories in the Bible. The pastor us talk about this one. You go, yeah, I already know that. You turn off. You open the Bible. I've already read that before. And we think, well, we've got it all in the back, so I don't need to read it anymore. That's when you need to go back to first base because you missed it. Nobody's an expert on God, so nobody's an expert on the Bible. And so... We can be in such a hurry that we forget to take care of our own self. And frankly, <laughs> the faster you drive, the faster you run out of gas. You ever realize that? Uh, yes, uh, again, I'm preaching to me because now, now I, I don't meet, I've never had to meet Jason, you know, Domino Dominguez because my cruise control saves me, okay? He, he, if you don't know, he is a highway patrolman, okay? Yeah, that, that's uh, Johnny's son, Jason Dominguez. He's a highway patrolman. So I haven't had to meet any of them because I, I 
set my cruise control. And if somebody wants to go real fast, I just let them go and get a ticket, and I just go right along. But um, I am a quick driver. I'm aware of that. Um, you know, the Bible tells you, the only place it tells you in the Bible how to drive, it says, Jehu drove his chariot furiously. So, you know, that's <laughs> what it says. First Kings, and you look it up. But still, you run out of, the faster you drive, the more you run out of gas. And when you're in a hurry and you don't pause to fill up, what happens? You run out. That's why you need to pause. It's, you know, you really need to stop if you have family at home to have dinner together. It's easy to think, oh, I'm going to grab something quick and I go here, go there. No, sit down and spend time together. That helps to recharge you. And also to take time to read the Bible. I know you've read it many times, but take time to read it and pray daily. You hearing me? I'm seeing some smiles, so that's a good thing. If you're running on empty, what happens? You're going to be out of gas. Anyway, six, not paying attention to my gauges. Now, I've already told you what happens to me with the gas gauge. It's blocked by my steering wheel, so in, in, a, in some way, I don't see it that well. You know, if you, you've got a big light on, and at that light, you wait until you get gas, and the light comes on and says, hey, stupid, get gas, right? You say, well, I don't have one of those as far as my emotional life. I don't have a light that pops off. Oh, oh but you do. What are those gauges that show up? Your sleep patterns. You know, if you say, well, I really can't sleep, you're probably stressed out. And you need to come to God and relax and spend time with God and recharge. Another gauge that you're having problems is you're irritable. You ever get irritable? Now, now I get hangry sometimes. If I don't eat, I mean, I might bite off your head. I don't know. So if I get stressed around you, it's because I haven't eaten. Just know that. But when we're stressed and worn out, we get irritable. So watch out for that. Um, and relationships. If you're not nurturing and encouraging your relationships of those around you, uh, there, there's an issue going on with you. So you need to work on that. And what about, uh, this is the one we don't want to talk about, weight. You know, sometimes when we get stressed and worn out, we just eat. I mean, food just go, it just jumps into our mouth and we don't know how it got there, but it got there and we were starting putting on weight. Well, that can be a gauge there's something going on. Hmm, attitudes. You have got a grumpy attitude? We don't like, you know, people don't around you if you're a grumpy attitude, right? So you got to watch those attitudes. Just get rid of them. Now, when also, when you're generous, you tend to have a great attitude. When you're not generous, there tends to be something going on there. You know, God is generous, and so there we're supposed to be generous. And when you're kind of holding everything back, you say, well, I, I don't want to do that. That may be an indicator that you, you're running on empty. And what about the worship attendance gauge? Now, you're here, so I'm preaching to the choir, but, you know, one thing COVID did, it got people isolated. And we say, well, I watched it on Facebook. I watched it on YouTube. You know what? It's not the same. Now, when the COVID first happened and they had us on lockdown, only 10 people would come, there were lots and lots of people watching us on Facebook Live. But finally it dropped down where only two or three were watching on Facebook Live, so we stopped doing that. But we sell it on Facebook, and over 400 people watch our, uh, our service online every week because it tells me how many uh, through plays. See, it's one thing just to get a click on it, and they go off. They go, well, I don't like him, so he needs more hair or something. or <laughs> They want somebody not wearing cowboy boots or something, whatever. But no, over 450 people watch through the, each week on the service. But it's a cheap substitute sitting in your easy chair calling it church because you need to be around other people. When you're by yourself, you get isolated and you lose the relationships. Well, yeah, you got, quote, some spiritual food, but it's nothing like being in person with people. So worship attendance. What about patience? Are you patient with other people? Hmm. 
when you're not patient with other people, you, that's a gauge saying, hey, you need to do some praying here. You need to do some more Bible, and you need to be around with other believers. Patience. No. See, I, I tend to want it right there, you know, quickly. And God says, no, slow down, be patient. So God gives me all the patience I need. So each of these gauge is kind of indicator that you need to watch out for. And what about number seven, being overloaded? You know, sometimes your car is carrying too much weight. I saw a truck, yes, it was a big one-ton truck, but he had in the back of his truck so much weight that it was holding his back wheels almost up as he was going down the road. I don't know what he had in the back of that truck, but it weighed a lot. And he, it was a one-ton truck, and he just kind of lifting up part of the frame, but it was hanging way down. See, his truck had more weight than it was designed to carry. And some of you are carrying around weight that you weren't designed to carry. You know, you can't carry everybody's load. Adults need to carry their own load. Now, every now and then, yes, people need a hand up, and we gladly to do that. But don't put too much weight on you or you're going to break. Um, I've got a... Um, A few months ago, I was reading about this guy that was going down the road, and some guy ahead of him was in a pet delivery truck. And every time he stopped at a red light, he'd get out and smack the side of that truck three or four times. And after about four or five lights, he got, what is going on with this guy with this two-by-four smacking against the side of his truck? So he asked him, what in the world are you doing with that two-by-four? He says, well, I've got a two-ton truck. I've got four tons of canaries. I've got to keep half of them flying so I don't come overloaded. <laughs> and that may be how you feel. You know what you're designed to do, but you're carrying too much weight, and it's breaking you. You need to unload some of the things that you're carrying. You've got too many things on your frying pan. You need to drop the load there. And eight, assuming the limits of my tank don't apply to me. <laughs> Assuming the limits of my tank don't apply to me. They apply to you, but they don't apply to me. You don't know how people are. You know, it's amazing. We can figure out what other people need to do, but we can't figure out what we're supposed to do. They need to do this and this and this. Yeah, but what about looking in the mirror? What about you? Like I said, my vehicle holds 26 gallons. I really think it holds 27. Otherwise, I would have run out of gas a couple of times. So, but... Some of, um, um, you know, so some of you have only like a 20-gallon tank or 12-gallon tank or 10-gallon tank, and you go, well, well, why can't you drive as far as I do? It's because your tank's not as big. And so emotionally, all of us can carry different loads. You know, some people get stressed out about certain things. A lot of stuff doesn't bother me, but some things do bother me a whole bunch. And so what bothers one person may not bother another one. But yet all of us have areas where we can easily be overloaded emotionally and spiritually. And so therefore we're past the limits on our tank and we're having problems. You know, some of us are workaholics. Okay, quit staring at me. Yes, I'm guilty as charged, yes. But I'm, I'm trying to take breaks. So I'm working at it um, because we can get working so much that we got to take a break. And um, it's amazing. Yesterday, um, I actually just got to goof off because nothing was going on. So I, I took a break yesterday. So I feel refreshed and encouraged today with y'all. One thing that really drains your tank is pride. Well, I can do it. I'm Superman. I'm John Wayne. I can handle it. And then we crash and burn. And uh, nine, not, wearing to, not knowing where to find a filling station. Now, that one time, that was pretty common, especially when you're driving long, on long trips. That's before we had these cell phones or these smartphones. It, you can tell, it tells you where the gas stations are, where the food is. I have yet to see it tell me where a church is, but it shows about everything else. 
And so you can find gas now because you can figure out where it is. But it, they really need to add a church on there so that you can find a church besides these other things because you need that more than probably anything else. You know, spiritually and emotionally, we need each other. And so we need to realize where to find it. Although some people try to think, well, well God's just everywhere. Well, I'm going fishing, so I'll meet him out there on the pond. You know what? That's a cheap story. Because you need to be with other people to have church. So, yes, you need times alone. Believe me, we need those times alone. But we also need times to gather together for mutual encouragement and love and care. Because where two or three are gathered, I'm there in their midst. So it's very important. And 10, not knowing how to fill my tank. You know, sometimes these newer cars, you got to go hunt for where to put the gas in. And they keep on having these new gas pumps, you got to figure out how they work. You know, used to, you'd swipe the card. Now, a lot of the pumps, no, you stick the card in. If you take it out, they go, you're messed up. you got to go inside. Well, what? My car's good. No, they want you to leave the card in there. And it goes through these gyrations and asks you your zip code. Although if you go to Bucky's, he doesn't care about your zip code. It seems like everybody else does, but Bucky's doesn't, so whatever. And he's got cheaper gas. Imagine that. So you put it in there. So, so how, to, how to fill your tank? Sometimes it's awkward. Now, your spiritual tank. Now, I've got four verses I've added, so don't look for them, okay? In Lamentations 2.11, Jeremiah says, My eyes have no more tears. And I'm sick at my stomach. I feel empty inside. Of course, Jeremiah wrote the book of Jeremiah and Lamentations. He says, and he was known as a weeping prophet because of verses like this. Um, you know, he's cried for this country, man. He's cried for what has happened. He just has nothing left. He's emotionally spent. And Job chapter 7, verse 3, Job says, I'm given months that are empty. Hmm, sounds like the pandemic, doesn't it? I've given months that are empty and nights of misery. So Job understands when you are emotionally, physically, spiritually exhausted. Isaiah put it this way, I have labored in vain, I've spent my strength for nothing and empty futility. He says, I'm just empty. Now, 2 Samuel 3.19, David says, even though I am uh, the appointed king, I feel empty. So you can say, well, I'm at the top of my game. I've reached the pinnacle of my career. I got my cover on a magazine. I mean, everything's wonderful. And as David put, hey, I'm king. But it doesn't matter what pinnacle you're on, you can still feel empty and need of encouragement and need spiritual vitality. So I want you to look for a second. Those 10 things I mentioned about Anna Gas. Circle, just take a look and circle which ones apply to you today. And you'll pass it in. We'll put your name on it. We'll see who. <laughs> no, that was great. <laughs> no. <laughs> but I could use Malva as a grader, but we won't do that. Just, this is for you to look at and think. It just gives you a gauge on how empty or how full you are. Okay. I'm going right along marking those. How many mark one of them? How about just two of them? You did three of them. What about four? What about five? <laughs> what about ten? <laughs> you know what? We all have some of those we need to check. And it's just a good way to encourage. Uh, to realize you're not alone. Other people feel drained. We live in a very fast-paced society. You know, when, and I tell you, if we lived in Houston, it would be worse. I remember when I first moved up here, my mother sent me out to Jimmy, uh, Johnny Grice's house. Johnny's my cousin, my mother's first cousin. 
uh, that's Marva's brother-in-law. And I took this piece of paper around to him, and I handed it to him. I said, I'll see you later. He said, well, well where are you going? Well, I'm going to go. No, 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 Max. Sit down. I said, well, why should I sit down? Sit down. And he says, Max, I've got to teach you something about being in the country. You've got to visit. So we visited for 30 minutes. And then he said, okay, you can go. So we can wear out our tank, get totally drained. You've got to spend time with other people, those that you love you and you love them. You've got to be encouraged. You've got to spend time with God and be restored so that then you can do greater things. Now, here's the other side, how to keep your tank full. You know, you, know, you can be emotionally empty, spiritually empty. You, your body, mind, and soul can be worn out, but God says, I've got plans for you. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus said, if you're tired from carrying that, those heavy burdens, come to me and I'll give your, you rest. Take my yoke upon you, then learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in spirit, and you'll find rest for your soul. For the yoke I share with you is easy to wear, and it makes the load light. So if you feel burdened down, wore out, even just a little bit, he says, come to me. So here's what you got to do. You got to get fed up with how you're feeling. You got to get fed up with how you're feeling. If you say, well, I'm just going to keep on going like I am. I'm going to keep on being burned out. I'm going to keep on being worn out. No, you won't do anything about it. You got to get fed up with how I'm feeling. Nothing's going to change your life until you're dissatisfied with where it is. You've come a long way in your life with your family and friends, but you got to say, you know what, I've got to make a change because I want to make my life better and I want to make the life of those around me better. Because remember, when you're out of gas and you're worn out and tired, what happens? You get angry, you get bitter, you bite off their head, you get unkind around other people. You don't want to be that kind of person. So you got to get fed up. I'm not going to be that. I'm going to be that encouraging, loving, caring person I know I am. So I'm going to change. And three things that people, um, three uh, things people would change is pain, perspective, or it's a choice. Consider Proverbs 20, verse 27. Solomon said this, The Lord gave us a mind and conscience so we cannot hide from ourselves. But sometimes it takes painful experiences to make us change our ways. Have you ever felt that painful experience? God got your attention. Okay, I'm going to turn around. Sometimes for us to see the light, we got to get the pain. And then we change. So until you're dissatisfied or and uncomfortable, say, until you decide, I'm going to make a change. You, you know, you've seen some people like this. They want to get better, but they get, they're, they're in that rut. And they're dissatisfied, they're unhappy, they're miserable, they make everybody around them miserable and unhappy. And you say, well, why don't you, and, until they decide they don't want to be that way anymore, they'll keep doing that. And so you've got to pray for them that they'll get out and make sure you're not that person. Make sure you're praying, you're seeking God, you're being with other believers, you're being encouraged, you're being generous, you're looking out for the needs of others. Taking care of things. Second, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. You remember that young fellow? He had an older brother, and he decides, you know what? Dad, you're, you're not dead yet, but I need your, my inheritance now. So he gets the inheritance, and he takes off. He says, I'm leaving. And so he goes over to Louisiana to the casinos and spends all of his money on wine, women, and song. And then he's broke. And so in Luke 15, verse 14, he wasted everything he had been given on foolish living until he was broke, miserable, and starving. Boy, that's a whole mouthful, isn't it? Broke, miserable, and starving. He had gotten a job feeding pigs. 
and he became so hungry, he was willing to eat the pig's food. Hmm. If you ever seen pig's food, you don't want pig's food. No. But finally, he came to his senses and said to himself, why am I living like this? At my father's house, even hired servants eat better than I do. So he decided to get up and go home to his father. So he decided to make a change. See, um, Solomon told us that it takes sometimes pain to motivate us from the, from the Proverbs. And the prodigal son here, he decided when he got to the bottom, he said, I don't have to live this way anymore. I'm done. I'm going to go back. I'm going to eat crow, and I'm going to go back to my father and tell him, I'm not worthy to be called a son. Let me be a servant. You know, Jonah is an example of waiting to the bottom before he finally turns around. And, um, you know, he literally at the bottom. Goes down to Joppa, down to the boat, down into the water, down into the belly of the fish, and then he finally wakes up. I don't know about you, but I'd wake up long before that. And Jonah 2.7, it's not up there, it's just extra. He says, when I had lost all hope, I turned my thoughts once again to the Lord. So sometimes people got to get all the way broken down before they'll turn around. I mean, he was right there at death. And he finally turns to God. Think on this. You might want to write this down. A breakdown is the door to a breakthrough. A breakdown is the door to a breakthrough. When you finally hit rock bottom, then you're pros to getting a breakthrough. There is no breakthrough until you have a breakdown. There is no breakthrough until you have a breakdown. Until you get to the point where it's either I've got to do something about this or it's just life isn't right. Until you have that breakdown, you're not going to have that breakthrough. But once that breakdown happens, you can break through and great things can happen in your life. And see, that's you got to break through pride, arrogance, self-sufficiency. See, so many times, well, I can just do it myself. Now, I can tell you right now, Everything that happens to me is all by the grace of God. And believe me, I know it. There is no other explanation how God's blessed me is God's blessing me. I'm not that smart. I'm just that blessed. In um, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus said, I have tried, I, if you're tired of carrying heavy loads, come to me and I will give you rest. So many people, yesterday I played golf, and, you know, they pair you up with people when you're playing golf. You don't know this person. Uh, he was a nice fella, but it was obvious that he had a lot of things in his life, but God just wasn't in it. You know, he, he was a college professor. He's from Houston and all this stuff. Basically, all, he, on his time off from that, he just played golf. I don't know about you, but I like to play golf. I like to do stuff like that. But if that is the whole pinnacle of your life, you miss life. And say, we're carrying these heavy loads. And God says, no, come to me and I'll lighten that load. I'll give you rest. Now notice, Jesus didn't say, come to religion. He says, come to me. Come to a personal relationship. He didn't say, come to rules, I'm going to give you all these kind of rules. No, he said, come to me. He didn't say, come to rituals and do these certain things a certain way, then God's supposed to move. No. Come to me. Come to that relationship. Come to me. The antidote to overload is coming to Jesus. This is an extra verse, too. John six thirty seven. Whoever comes to me, I will not reject. You say, well, you don't know what I've been through. You know how I've lived. No, whoever comes to me, Jesus says, I will not reject. When you come to Jesus, nobody is cast out. He says, remember, come to me and I will give you rest. 
in Isaiah 40, 29. He gives power to come to those who are tired and worn out. He offers strength to the weak. So when you come to Jesus, and you're tired, you're worn out, you're emotionally worn out, your relationships are not where you need to be, you're fatigued, you want to accomplish, and it's just not happening, come to Jesus, and he will give you rest. See, the culture says you got to do more. you got to do more and more and more. you got to have more. you got to get more. you got to get ahead of everyone. And what happens? It doesn't work. You've got to come to Jesus. Come to me. Three, this is a hard one for us, give up control. See, we like to be in control. We like to organize. We've got to set things up. We want it going our way. You give up control. The reason we're overloaded, we, we want to be in control. And that's how we get extra stuff on us we aren't supposed to have. Because when, uh, we have all these things before us. And we go, well, it needs to be done this way and that way and this. And what happens? The only way it can do it right is if I do it right. So you put everything, load everything up on you instead of trying to share the load with others. And so you get this heavy load on you while the others are not carrying anything. And it breaks you down. So you've got to give up control. And you give it up to, to Jesus. So you give you, Jesus everything of mine is now yours. I, it's his anyway. And you leave everything behind. So it's all his anyway. So you give it back over to him and say, oh God, what do I need to do? What do I need to accomplish? You know, so many times people feel like they're accomplishing a lot and all they're doing is staying busy. You say, what do I mean by that? I've said this several times, and I'm saying it again. See, a good teacher repeats and repeats and tells you again. You've got A's in your life. You've got C's in your life. You've got B's and C's and D's and F's. Some people spend all their life taking care of their D's and their F's. And they, man, they're so busy. They're getting things done, they think. But you're not taking care of your A's. And, and even if you get to a B, that's a mind, but you really need to t make sure your A's, and I find in life, if you don't take care of your A's, everything else falls apart. And so we can be so busy doing stuff that the most important things never get done, and we wonder why we're worn out and tired and exhausted all the time. Because we're trying to control all these little things instead of focusing on the most important. And see, subconsciously we're thinking, well, it all depends on me. The world's going to fall apart if it's not me. I got news for you. You're not Atlas. <laughs> You're not holding the world up. <laughs> and we got all these balls in the air. You know, we might have 20 balls in the air. You know, a juggler doesn't even try to juggle 20 balls in the air. But a lot of people, they try to juggle 20 things at one time. Well, I can do it. And what happens? They get worn out. And so giving up control is, he says, Take my yoke upon you. You say, well, that doesn't sound like liberation. That sounds like I'm being tied on to something. No, it doesn't. See, the yoke fits between two animals, or it could fit one. And see, when you're the only one being in that yoke, you're by yourself. You're trying to pull all of your load all by yourself. And he's saying, I don't want you doing it all by yourself. Let me join with you. So instead of one ox, you, you got Jesus, the second ox, next to you. So therefore, you're yoked together, and you carry the load much easier. Versus you, try, you trying to pull your own wagon by yourself. Get this, the purpose of the yoke is to lighten the load by sharing it. To lighten the load by sharing it. So the purpose of the yoke is to lighten the load by sharing it. Now, when you come to Jesus, you say, I'm, I'm giving this all to you. I'm, okay. Notice, you don't get in the wagon and Jesus only pulls the wagon then. 
he's the only one yoked up. See, that's how some people think. Well, I'll get, in Jesus, I'll get with Jesus, and so I'll get in the, in the wagon, and he can just pull me and do everything. No. He expects you to do your part. Believe in faith that he is going to do his part. And he won't act until you do your part. And you see, he comes alongside you, and he's the stronger one, so therefore it makes your load a lot easier because he's pulling the majority of the weight. But you're doing your part, you're on the other side, and what happens? Great things happen. Because you're rested, he's strengthened you, you're carrying more because he's with you. Instead of you pulling your wagon by yourself, you got Jesus there helping you join in with you to pull that wagon. So in Matthew eleven thirty, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. My yoke fits perfectly. See, the yoke is, is a picture of a partnership that God has chosen to enter in with you where he's joined in with you. So you're teamed up to carry the load in your life. Jesus says, I'll share your load. In Psalms 55, verse 22. Pile your troubles on God's shoulders. He'll carry your load and help you out. So you just pile the load on there, and he'll help you carry it. In Galatians 5, 25. Let us keep in step with the Spirit. So, so you can't know what the Spirit's doing unless you're praying, reading your Bible, because then it tunes you to when the Spirit wants to lead you to do something. Rarely does He speak, but many times it's that, yeah, I'm supposed to turn here. You, you don't know why I'm supposed to turn there, but turn there. Why are you supposed to go to a meeting? Why am I supposed to say go to Cots Cafe today instead of over to Caltalk? You know, those are the only two restaurants that serve a traditional breakfast, right? So I go one or the other, you know. And sometimes I have I just stay at home and have a smoothie. You know, my my, my I got a five burner stove that has never been used. <laughs> my oven gets worked, it gets used. <laughs> oh man. In Romans 3 28, our lives get in step with God by letting him set the pace. Our lives get in step with God by letting him set the pace. You know, sometimes, frankly, he wants us to really run and push hard. And, but the most of the time, he wants us to take a steady walk. And sometimes he says, sit down. <laughs> because we've been running too hard. Stay with him. Let him set the pace in your life. Four, learn to trust. Learn to trust. This is the antidote to anxiety, worry. Trust more. Matthew eleven twenty nine. He says, learn from me. I am gentle and humble at heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. You've got to learn to rest in Jesus. What many people do, they sit and worry. They worry this could happen or that could happen. They fret about it. They get stressed about it. Well, what if this happens or that happens? 95% of the things you're worrying about don't ever happen. And most of the things you wouldn't have to worry about it if you just did something. But you say, well, I want to worry about it. If, if you can do something about it, do it. If not, give it to Jesus. But most of the things we worry about calamity and things going wrong, not going to happen. Consider this. It says gentle and humble are antidotes to two causes of stress. Why is this so important? Gentle and humble. Because it's the opposite of what wears us out. Aggression. We don't wait and pause or consider. What's the opposite of aggression is being gentle and humble. 
I've watched people try to aggressively sell some things. And what happens when you try to aggressively sell them? You might get some sales, but what happens most of the time, the buyer disappears. It's amazing. They just go away. And when we try to get too aggressive in, in, in life, what happens? It sends off a warning light in the person you're dealing with. Well, oh, there's something wrong because they're being overly aggressive. And you think, well, the more aggressive I can be, the more I'll do. No, the more aggressive you are, the more it turns a red light on the other person, and they scatter. And what about arrogance? Arrogance is the opposite of gentle and humble because arrogance says, I control everything. I'm in charge. I write the checks. I make all the decisions. Well, maybe, maybe not. Because when we get arrogant, what happens? We climb up that ladder, and what happens? Suddenly we fall off that ladder and hit our head at the bottom of the pile. You know, I, I can do it without God. I can do my own thing. And we get all the way up, and we fall off the ladder and smack our head. And we go, well, how did I get down here? I thought I made it to the top. I could do anything. Yeah, you're at the bottom now. Because you weren't gentle and humble. You've got to, you know, the thing about in life, the more gracious you are in trying to get things done, generally the more you'll get done. Now, I know there are times, just like Jesus cleaned out the temple of the money changers. He didn't walk up to them, oh, please move your stuff. No, he just moved their stuff. <laughs> and nobody, the only thing, they said, well, for what authority are you doing this? Now, he wasn't mean or whatever. He just went there and took it out. And people go, what you doing? He just took it out. He cleaned everything out. And sometimes you just got to clean things out. But you don't have to run them over a Mack truck, you know, just clean them out. Because what? You're gentle and humble. Why? Humble means what? You're under God's control. So it's not about me. It's about God. So God's got me. God's leading me. God's given me the opportunity, the wisdom to make decisions. And so therefore, it's the opposite. Gentle and humble are the antidotes to aggression and arrogance. And see, when we get arrogant, we think, well, I can handle it all. What happens? You wind up with a great failure. You see it over and over again. In Proverbs 20, 24, since the Lord is directing our steps, why don't we try to understand everything that happens along the way? So as you're going through, if you're sensitive, you'll realize how God is ordering your steps and helping you through. So make sure it's Him. You know, one thing, there's a lot of things we're not going to figure out this side of heaven. You realize that? You can look at blessings and so forth in your life. Well, why did I get that blessing? Why did that door open for me? You'll never know this side of heaven, but acknowledge who opened the door. In Psalms 142, verse 3, when I am ready to give up, he knows what I should do. Sometimes we've got to say, God, I surrender to you. I've been trying to run this show on my own. I've been trying to do it on my own. I surrender all. There's an old song like that. So we need to learn to trust him more. In Romans 10, verse 17, faith comes from hearing the word of God. So you need to hear the word of God. You've got to read it. Remember, don't just read it. Say it and hear it. That way it goes through all of your senses. You'll remember much more about the scripture if you read it out loud when you're studying it. Five, start every day by filling my tank. Now remember I said you can fill your tank the night before or that morning, whichever works your schedule. So don't say, well, I don't have time in the morning. Well, you can do it at night then. I've done both. Both of them work. But fill your tank up before you leave out for the day. Now, it's this terrible thing I talk about. It's called quiet time. You go, yeah, pastor, I've heard that. Yeah, quiet time. Okay. Do it. <laughs> Just do it. 
You want to have the spiritual vitality, the relational vitality, and the joy in your life God wants you to have. You need to have that quiet time with God. Proverbs 6, I mean, Matthew 6, 6. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God and you'll begin to sense his presence. So that quiet place, spending time with him. Now I've told you, HWFW, his word, first word, and HWLW, his word, last word. So at night, read the scripture some before you go to sleep. In the morning, read it as well. And pray multiple times a day. I don't know about you, but I need encouragement throughout the day, not just one time of the day. Take the time. Six, connected to my spiritual family. Stay connected to my spiritual family. Hebrews 10, 25. Let us not give up the habit of meeting together as some are doing, and said, let us be encouraged one another all the more. Let me read that again. Hebrews 10, 25. You already know it, but here it is. Let us not give up the habit of meeting together as some are doing, and said, let us encourage one another all the more. You know, some people have in their mind, well, today people don't attend church like they used to. Well, different times in history, people have attended church more. But even in the first, with the first church, the first ones were there. There were some, you know, people would drift away and come back. You know, you need each other. And don't think, well, I'm the Lone Ranger. I, I can do it. I don't need others. I can just sit here on my couch and go to church. No, you're, you are not listening to God because God says you're supposed to gather together with believers. So if you need to come to church with a mask, fine. We got our tables spread out, so fine. You can come, you can keep distance, whatever you want, but you need to be here and worship God together. So we need that refilling, that encouragement, especially during this COVID-19 time because people feel isolated. That's why you need to be with other people so you're not isolated. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 in the Amplified Translation. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy, laden, and overburdened, and I will cause you to rest. I will ease and relieve and refresh your souls. Take my yoke on me, on you, partner with me, and learn from me, for I am gentle and I'm humble in heart, and you'll find rest, relief, and ease, and refreshment, and recreation, and blessed quiet for your souls. I love that translation. Friend, yes, you need to receive Christ Jesus as your Savior. That's the beginning. But then every day, spend time with him that he'll restore your soul and give you strength and endurance like you'd never dream possible. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, starting point, realizing how empty we can be by being burdened by the cares and fast-paced life and amazing trials we suffer in this world. But Lord, you're in control. And I'm tired without rest and peace. Forgive me for all I've done and try to rest now more in you than ever before. Help us to let you be the pace setter of our lives and help us stop trying to control everything. Let you be first place. Forgive our arrogance and aggression and help us to be a lot more patient and forgiving towards others just as you forgive us. Forgive us for pridefully overworking our schedule and overloading it. And help us to live the life that you want us to live with the joy and peace and yet accomplishing much because you opened the doors and blessed us in ways we never dreamed possible. Help us this day as we draw near to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Let us stand for this time of invitation. Invite you.